All right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not so experienced with these things. Can, pe can people hear me? Yes. Terrific. So welcome to our panel. This is a fantastic group of people before you, and we're so excited. We only have an hour and 15 minutes to discuss basically all the problems in the world. Um, <laughs> so we're going to try to be as efficient as possible. We're also going to try, we're entering the 21st century. Innovation starts here, so we're using this texting thing. Um, and I, I, you know, it's, you know, I know, I'm going to embarrass my students during this whole thing. I'm sorry. It's just going to happen. So um, did people, uh, how many people did this? Now we're going to go back to oh, old wow. school. Okay. That's pretty good. So it's basically, so this is what you talk about, bias survey, right? Because the only people who took it were the students who could figure out how to do it. So this is, okay. Um, this is how it works. Um, okay. So I um, am going to read only the abbreviated bios of these incredible people because honestly it would take an hour and 15 minutes just to read their bios. So uh, this in no means uh, is, their, is their whole life, but I want to talk specifically about the uh, things and their experiences that they have had that relate specifically to our topic of innovative legal services in an era of uncertainty. So I am going to first start with Dean Martha Minow. Um, Dean Minow needs little introduction, but some of you might not know that she is the vice chair of the Legal Services Corporation Board. LSC is the largest funder of legal services for low-income people in the country. Dean Minow was appointed to the bipartisan board by President Obama in his first term. During, his te or during her tenure at LSC, she has co-chaired the Pro Bono Task Force, among many things. Among her many awards and accomplishments, she recently won, uh, along with the LSC chair, uh, fellow alum John Levi, the Sergeant Shriver Equal Justice Award for their work promoting access to justice. In this age of uncertainty about LSC funding, she has been a leader with her colleagues in protecting the critical source for funding for legal aid. I'd li next like to turn to Judge Fisher. Judge Fern Fisher has an impressive and extensive career through um, legal services, academia, court reform, the judiciary, I could go on. Um, but I will start with uh, some of the highlights. Um, until July of 2017, am I correct about that? Uh, she was Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for the New York City Courts and also served as the Director of the New York State Courts Access to Justice Program. And she is a national leader in the Access to Justice movement. She served as a judge for 28 years, I confirmed that, and spent an unprecedented 20 years as a court administrator. In that 28 years as a judge, she started out as a housing court judge and was later elected to the Supreme Court of the State of New York and then the administrative judge at the Civil Court of the City of New York. She was one of the relatively small number of 1978 Harvard Law grads who went into public interest. Is that true? Uh, judge Fisher began as a hearing officer in the city's rent control program, followed by employment for the Harlem <laughs> Services. Okay, moving on. She's an amazing person. No. Um, she, she was the recipient. We need to say this. She was the recipient of the Gary Bellow yes, Public Interest world. Award. <laughs> And today, Judge Fisher is the Special Assistant for Social Justice Initiatives to the Dean of the Maurice Dean School of Law at Hofstra University and is a visiting associate professor. Mike Grinthal um, is here with his lovely family and his daughter, who seems to be the best behaved child I've ever seen. Um, Mike is a supervising attorney with the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center in New York. Michael has been ha a housing attorney in New York City for more than 10 years, including as a staff attorney at South Brooklyn Legal Services and a supervising attorney at MFY Legal Services, which I think has maybe a new name. It's now Mobilization for Justice. Okay. Where he supervised... Um, Housing, um, supervised housing uh, attorneys. Michael graduated from Harvard Law School, has a master's degree in public administration from the Kennedy School, clerked for Nancy Gertner, and before becoming a lawyer, uh, Mike worked as a community organizer for six years, including in Lynn, Massachusetts, a place dear to my heart, so thank you. Uh, Jenna Collins is an alumni of the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. <laughs> She was a member of the family practice with Werner here to play. <laughs> yes. um, 
Since graduating in 2011, after he got over being Werner's student, Jenna has worked on issues of housing and energy services for low-income Philadelphians, both at the AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania and currently at Community Legal Services. Jenna was also a visiting professor at Drexel University in their community lawyering clinic. And she was also named, I learned this on the internets, that she was one of the upcoming attorneys uh, in Philadelphia who are changing the legal community in Philly, so that's cool. Blake Strode is the executive director of the Arch City Defenders, a leading holistic civil rights firm in St. Louis, Missouri, Blake's hometown. Blake was a Skadden Fellow at Arch City, and Blake helped establish the Civil Rights Litigation Unit, which has filed more than 30 cases impacting upwards of 40,000 people in the St. Louis region. Blake also played a significant role in the class action debtors prison case against the city of Jennings, Missouri, and co-authored an article in the Atlantic titled Debtors Prison in 21st Century. If you haven't read that article, please, it's, it's incredible. Blake graduated um, 20 years ago, no, three, okay, this is ridiculous, he's done all of this in three years. Um, Blake graduated from HLS in 2015, where he did many great things, including serving on the board of Project No One Leaves, which, and running um, an incredible conference of community organizers and lawyers across the country. And he participated, and I'm doing this in a shout out for the Legal Services Center. He was a <coughs> clinical student in the housing clinic. Yes. So, Woo! amazing group. So all of these people have amazing pers different perspectives, um, an enormous wealth of experience to talk about our topic. I, I think you, some of you might notice there's a slight bias towards housing attorneys. I apologize, it was totally accidental. Um, <laughs> as I am a housing attorney um, and a clinical instructor at the Harvard Legal <laughs> Paper. But the, the, Kathy and Jillian, who are the responsible for this amazing panel, both are in the family unit. So I, th I think that the bias was totally unexpected. Intention. Okay, so we have, well, I'm going to um, ask questions, but while I'm doing that, you see a note card in front of you. If you have questions while we're talking, while the panelists are talking, please write it down, Jillian and Kathy. And for those of you call, who understand texting, there you can also text your question to that. Nope. Okay, so let's get to the heart of it. The, the backdrop of this discussion of innovation in legal services we need to remember that 60 million Americans are living below 125% of the poverty line. Um, this means roughly $15,000 for an individual or $30,000 for a family of four. This is the cutoff for LFC programs. Unlike uh, many programs, though, like the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, have a cutoff of 200% poverty because there's the belief that 125% leaves too many people uh, who are low income without access to a lawyer. Um, and to give you a context of how many Americans that means who are 200% below the poverty rate, that's 95 million low income people, almost a third of our country. According to the Legal Services Report uh, entitled The Justice Gap, Measuring the Unmet Civil Legal Needs of Low Income Americans, published last year, 86% of the civil legal needs faced by the 60 million uh, low-income Americans received inadequate or no legal help. Yet at the same time, the president's FY 2018 budget proposed to zero out, eliminate altogether all funding for the Legal Services Corporation. As I said, the largest source of civil legal aid funding. Uh, fortunately, due to bipartisan efforts of the LSC board and members of Congress, like HLS and HLAB alum, Representative Joe Kennedy, and alo along with Representative Susan Brooks of Indiana, a Republican, on March 23rd, 2018, President Donald Trump signed into law uh, the Omnibus Appropriations Act, which gave $410 million to the Legal Services Corporation, which was a $25 million increase over last year, a remarkable achievement in part, part mostly to, to Team Meadow and many others. So. So this, so Dean and I'd like to turn to you. Um, in while the issue this year was resolved, uh, funding was resolved favorably. Um, even with that status quo, we are in a position where 86 percent of the legal needs, civil legal needs of low-income Americans, are not being met. So. I know that you and your colleague, John Levi, are 
unsatisfied with that status quo and have made the goal of closing the justice gap by 2026. And I guess I would ask you, what does that look like to you? What does that mean? And how does LSC play a role in that? Well, thank you. And first, thank you, Eloise, for all your work uh, putting together this panel, but in general, every single day, all your work. And if anyone in this room had anything to do ever with legal services or with legal aid or anything in the pro bono world, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. This is fantastic, really. So uh, that, of course, is the very big issue. I just should give a little bit of... Uh, background, because President Trump would like to, to shut down the Legal Services Corporation, he's not appointing anyone to it. So irony of ironies, it's the Obama board that's in charge. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and one of the strategies that we've had is to actually develop uh, note cards that have a story from each jurisdiction and to be able to go into every congressperson, every senator's office, and say, here's somebody from your, uh, your district who was helped. And you know what really makes a difference? Um, it is a bipartisan uh, effort. Um, I am, for example, uh, not allowed to lobby. Um, so whatever I'm saying here, I'm not lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, you know, it is uh, not going to get better. We're very lucky that actually we did a little bit better this year, but the needs are just so overwhelming. You know, anyone who's worked in housing knows that 90% of the landlords are represented, 90% of the tenants are not. Um, and so we have just pervasive inequalities, systemic inequalities, that will not be addressed even if we were able to give a lawyer to each person. Um, and that's not going to happen. So. There are initiatives that are underway. They're all inadequate, but um, they're, they're the best we have. One is to expand pro bono. In many parts of the country, actually, the most innovative work is working with faith-based organizations, with churches, synagogues, and mosques, um, and to do organizing and also outreach. Um, uh, another kind of innovation in pro bono is to marry it with technology. Um, and to do triage with technology and match people um, with people who are willing to offer services with people who have needs uh, immediately. There, um, another initiative that the, I'm excited about is working with librarians. In many communities, um, one of the most trusted places is the library. And in many communities for poor people, it's the only access to broadband or computers. So doing training with librarians so that they can actually help people access services is helpful. Um, and I actually do think technology is not a solution, but it offers some tools. Um, besides the pro bono matching service that I've already identified, you know, in Georgia, I was very fascinated to find that technology actually means your data service plan. So having hotlines and then coming up with some rules so that the data service providers, the phone providers, actually um, allow people who are low income to have more minutes so that when they're waiting online, they haven't used up all their minutes. But technology can also include artificial intelligence and designing programs that do self-assembly of, uh, of forms um, or ask people questions and based on that produce uh, filings. There are initiatives that are statewide to develop uh, one-stop shopping. Microsoft is partnering uh, with Hawaii and Alaska uh, to develop uh, portals that will connect anyone who has access to any digital device to the legal services in their community, including pro bono and others. Um, and I just saw a version demonstration of that in a Florida program that actually um, tries to avoid confusing people by, after you, the individual answers questions, give them the resources for which they are eligible so they don't have to sort through and navigate um, a, a mess. None of these are adequate, but they're the beginning of something. Um, but probably, you know, what Legal Services Corporation cannot do, but others at this panel can do, is work on law reform. Because a lot of the problems that um, we're really uh, uh, facing are the laws are cumbersome, or the system is cumbersome. Um, and that's for others, and I look forward to hearing from them. Thank you. Judge Fisher, uh, you have, you entered, uh, 
you've been in the system in New York for uh, many, many years, but then you, you took on this role of head of the Access to Justice program. And I saw some statistics um, in preparation for this that said in 2013, there were 1.8 million litigants in New York that were not represented by counsel in civil proceedings. Um, specifically, as um, Dean Minow said, uh, you know, in New York, the statistics are even worse in house, places like housing court, 99% of the tenants. Uh, it's actually better now. It's better now. I know. This is this is to show how, how effective you've been. This, these, are, these, are, these are the before shots. Um, so, but when the, when you came and, and started this job with this many New Yorkers not represented, did, did you just you didn't just throw up your hands? So what did, where did you start and how did you uh, tackle this huge problem? Well, it's not my personality to just throw up my hands. <laughs> uh, never was. Um, you know, I was a legal services attorney and I was a housing legal services attorney. So my exposure and my knowledge and the understanding of what people go through came from that. And I brought that into my judgeship. Um, I was lucky to be appointed as an administrator um, fairly early in my career. So I was a court administrator for 21 years. So of the 28 years, I was a court administrator. Um, and I was only in charge of the Access to Justice program uh, for the state of New York uh, for nine years. But my Access to Justice efforts started when I first became a court administrator and starting with trying to fix the housing court, which uh, if you look, if you Google it, it was the most maligned court in the country, I would say. Somebody calls it the, was it the, uh, the Calcutta Bazaar or something. <laughs> um, and I started with, un with an understanding that people needed lawyers and that I wanted to provide as much legal assistance to people as I possibly could. And so, uh, and I started a bunch of volunteer lawyer programs. But over the years, my thinking started to evolve because no matter how many volunteer attorneys we trained or how many legal aid programs I was able to get to come into the courthouse, it wasn't going to be enough. And, when, and I want to expand the conversation just a little broader to, to beyond poverty, but to, to working poor and moderate income people who can't afford lawyers either. And so I knew that even if we could do a good job of providing assistance to people 125% or 200% below the poverty level, we still had another category of people who were never going to be eligible for lawyers. So my thinking evolved to working towards 100% effective legal assistance. And a lot of the things that I did as either the head of the housing court, well actually the head of the civil court, and housing court is part of the civil court, um, and in charge of access to justice, I had that goal in mind. And so if I had to highlight um, what I thought was most important separate from getting attorneys involved and doing more pro bono and unbundling and things like that. Does everybody know what unbundling is? Raise your hands. <laughs> you see, this is a problem, okay? So whole other conversation, all right? One thing that my students do not leave Hofstra without knowing what unbundling is, and we can have another conversation about that. But, um, you know, the... Uh, key things, I think, in terms of my evolving thinking was, uh, one, the use of non-lawyers. Um, and I know as lawyers we don't want to hear that. And I'm, <laughs> I'm not as, uh, has anybody seen this book, Rebooting uh, Justice? You have to read it. Yes. It's a quick read. I'm not on the, on, the, on the line of thinking that we need to get rid of lawyers in some categories of, of cases, so relax. But I do believe that the use of non-lawyers can help uh, uh, make the uh, justice system just a little, a little less uh, unfair. Um, the use of technology and the court, uh, New York State is a leader in the use of technology. There are 25 uh, A2J programs and this is a program using a software that was developed by Chicago Kenton Law School where uh, litigants can go in and print out forms or get information We're using an intuitive kind of program. And we are the leaders. I don't take credit for it. My staff gets the credit for it. Um, because I, technology and I don't necessarily understand each other, but my <laughs> staff did. Um, and the use of interdisciplinary efforts to solve problems. People don't come with just legal problems. They come with social service problems. And until we address the social services problems, the legal problems aren't going to go away or they're just going to recur. 
And so I made an effort to do interdisciplinary programs. We had a homeless prevention program that used social, uh, social workers, a guardian ad litem program that used lawyers and social work, uh, a program for senior citizens that used lawyers and social work, workers. One of my staff members was an attorney, and she had an MSW. Um, so those are the three things. Um, and I would say the fourth thing was making sure that the court was viewed by the community as being part of the solution to problems not just the problem maker. And so community outreach and cultural competency in the court uh, and dealing with judges who are not necessarily culturally competent or culturally sensitive, uh, those are, I would say, would be a fourth thing. Um, and in terms of the numbers, the 1.8 is an estimate, and that's one of the problems in our country. We really don't know how many people don't have lawyers. Uh, it's a good estimate, but it's still an estimate. Part of the reason why the numbers went from 2.1 to 1.8 is the fact that New York State has a lot of money for lawyers. Uh, there's $100 million from the state legislature for lawyers, and the New York City Council has just passed universal access to counsel legislation, which will give every poor person an attorney full representation, which I don't quite agree with. I think some people can use limited, but whatever, I'll take it. Um, and so that had a lot to do with the numbers coming down, but also the consumer debt crisis. Uh, the economy's gotten a little bit better, so we don't have as many consumer debt, but because of policy decisions that we made in New York State as to how third-party debt collectors could maintain their cases in court and, or not maintain their cases in court, the numbers started to trickle down, and that made a big difference. There's a law review article that I wrote in Georgetown Law, law Review about the consumer debt and what we did in New York, and we were one of the leaders on that. So I've been very fortunate to um, be in a leadership position um, to make change, and leadership comes with not just idea, but, the, but ideas with the ability to get people to make those ideas happen. Um, and I, I clearly my education here at Harvard had something to do with it. Um, not, not completely, I think my background had a lot to do with it as well. But uh, New York, I would like to see more things happen in New York, courts. Uh, I've decided to work from the outside and sometimes being on the outside is better than being on the inside because uh, now I can actually criticize the court. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Michael and I met at one point where a tenant organization, uh, a community organization came to, to c c critique and complain about the housing court. So as a uh, court administrator, I had to be neutral because I had parties on both sides to, to work with. Um, and now I'm in the position of not having to be neutral to go back to where I started and that being an advocate for, for people who aren't receiving true access to justice. And it also gives me an ability to criticize the uh, current administration, which I'm having a ball doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great transition to Mike, who, uh, um, when I asked about innovation in your work, you responded along the lines of, you know, that you innovate every day, but in a very old-fashioned way. <laughs> um, and, and I don't, guess I would like you to explain what you meant by that and sort of how you think that um, whether in your model or the model that you use, whether that's something that more organizations and more lawyers should use. Sure. Um, I also want to echo Dean Minow in thanking you guys for, for bringing us here. Um, and thanks, everybody here, for, for giving us an audience. Um, so I'm lucky enough that in, in the places that I've worked as a legal services attorney, there have been places where there's been room to try things out, where there's been room uh, and support to do things like build relationships with community organizations and organizers, build relationships with um, faith-based organizations and community institutions. And I know that that didn't come for free. Having the time and the support to do that literally costs money. Um, and so I, I think that that's vital. I think that it's something that we have to do. And that's what, uh, that's what I meant when I said um, innovation, old-fashioned innovation, because the basic practice of trying to be relational, of relating of, as a lawyer, being in relationship with others in the community, schools, teachers, principals, ministers, organizers, social workers, um, is, is old-fashioned. We didn't invent it. 
Um, we haven't mastered it. Uh, we haven't outgrown it. Um, but it is still innovative every day because every time we do that, every time we enter into these relationships, it forces us to stop acting from within the models that we have as lawyers, especially as legal services lawyers, where there can be very, very heavily structured models. We have our intake. Um, there's sort of a pipeline. Clients come to us. We have a way of working the cases. We practice in a certain forum. I would go to housing court. It's very possible to just keep doing things um, with the faith that the inbox will keep filling. If we do certain things, we'll move things to the out cases to the outbox, and they'll go out. Um, but every time that we would work to build a relationship, every time I would go to a church and sit down with the priest, um, we would have a conversation, and that was risky, that was dangerous, because what they were interested in or what they needed us to do wasn't necessarily going to fit within that pipeline. They might say, the people who come here on Sunday, this is what I hear them talking about. And great if we could say, well, that's exactly what we do. We'll just connect your pipeline up to our pipeline and everything will keep going great and our funders will love that and that's what they want us to do. But most of the time it doesn't work like that. Um, and to be able to say we're going to follow that, we're going to change what we do and what our not only what our model is, but our own take on what our priorities should be based on um, what you know our legal analysis of the system or our understanding of what people come to us with, or most often just our sense of well, we know what cases we can win, and we know what cases we can't win, and we know what cases on the edge we'd like to push the law on, so that's what we're going to do. But then here are these people over here in this, the teachers in this school saying, well, this is what all the families need. And to us, well, those are not winnable cases. Those don't fit into our model. So, we've, but, so we can either say, well, it was nice talking to you. Have a nice day. Um, the legal system is not set up to help you guys. Or we can allow ourselves to be decentered into that relationship and say, well, somehow we're going to do that because that's what's important to this school and this neighborhood. And we're going to have to figure out how to do that. We're going to have to figure out what to do with the, with the no-win cases that we would, when they call our hotline, we just say, yeah, I'm really sorry. This is a tough position that you're in. But I'll tell you, as an attorney, you can't win this case. We can't just hang up on them anymore. Um, and so that means every morning when we get up, if we're lucky enough to have the kind of flexibility that I've had because of the hard work of people, and I think New York City is is somewhat unique in this way because of the hard work that people have put in to create that space, to create access to justice, universal access to counsel, especially at a time when uh, when everywhere people in nonprofits are battening down the hatches and trying to figure out how are we going to get away with, how are we going to keep operating when we know we're going to be under attack. We're lucky enough in New York City to have both a solid tradition uh, of building movements, of building the tenants movement, of building legal services um, that can't be destroyed in four years or two years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, as well as, um, this, so that's why I say that the innovation is old fashioned, right? We're not, um, you know, when I was here, when I was at Harvard, I was often encouraged to think that I could solve every problem and what was I going to do about it. And then when it came time to apply for fellowships, I was encouraged to design a project um, and bring it to a community. Um, fortunately, I didn't have to do that. Fortunately, I met people in the community who created a project for me based on what they were doing. Um, but that's, again, you know, we, it, it, go, it goes against the grain of what I think we're encouraged to think here, which is, which is that the innovation that we're doing is not us coming up with a new idea and revolutionizing the poor folks out there. I don't mean poor folks. I mean, the, you know, those, those folks who didn't go to Harvard, um, <laughs> those lawyers who went to 
Cornell or places like that. Watch out. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, you thought you were uh, all amongst friends. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, but who've created the tradition that we're entering into, um, and that if you know, and who have created a line of innovation that we have to keep going with. Because, and I'll just say finally, you know, we win a lot, but we are losing. We're losing. We, we. I'm sure this is your your experience too. I win most of my cases. You know, it's it's possible to win. You know, not because I'm great, but because because they're winnable cases. Um, but I walk through the neighborhood where all of my cases came from, and even 10 years ago, that neighborhood was still there, and it's not. It's not there anymore. We are losing, uh, even though we win our cases, there are waves that are sweeping people out of their neighborhoods. Um, and, we, and that's why we need to innovate. We need to be scratching and scraping every minute to think of how to do something that we aren't doing yet. Because if we're just satisfied with what we're doing, if we're just satisfied with our pipelines of bringing the cases in and winning them and sending them back out again, then we will preside over the loss of everything that we are fighting for. Uh, and that's, and we owe it to the people who came before us, who passed on the traditions of innovation, who have carved out the spaces that we have to make use of them, to figure out new things to do, even if it is just a conversation with a pastor or a teacher, we have to be led in those directions. Thank you. Jenna, you have also, I think, taken what Mike described in many ways, we sometimes call community lawyering or community organizing approach to lawyering. And I was hoping that you could speak a little bit about how that's informed your work in Philadelphia. Um, in your, your housing work, but you've done a variety of things. If you could talk about that, that would be great. Sure. So um, I woke up this morning to an email from two of the paralegals in my office that said, we were at this development last night doing a tenant meeting. Um, all of the tenants in this building had gotten a notice earlier in the week that said, be out by April 30th, we're shutting off all the utilities, and we're padlocking the door, so you need to be gone. Mm -hmm. And we had three people come into our office for intake saying, we got this notice, we're really scared, what do we do? Within a week, we had set up a time to go in and do a community meeting. We had talked to a city council person. Um, we would gotten all these people on board, and then these two paralegals went out. In their evening, they took their, their own personal time and volunteered to go do this as representatives of our office to sit with the tenants, talk about their concerns, explain to them what their rights are, and to say, you don't actually have to be out of here by April 30th. I mean, they had gotten this notice that looked like the city was coming to shut down the building, but we had a city council member there saying, the city has nothing to do with this. Um, and so I think that's a great example of three community members come into our office, they tell us what a problem is, and we go out and respond to it. And so that was, okay, we're going to sit and then do intakes after this community meeting. I just like these lovely paralegals who took their, like, five to nine on a Wednesday night and sat there to do this um, because they really care about, I mean, and this is also a part of Philadelphia that is rapidly gentrifying. This is West Philadelphia. It's what, if you were, when I first moved to Philly seven years ago, this area would have been considered a no-go for, like, Penn students, right? And now suddenly there's student housing going up everywhere in this neighborhood, and that's why this particular development was saying they're going to lock everyone out. They had sold to a developer. They want to, there's student housing going in where West Philadelphia High School used to be. There's a beautiful new West Philadelphia High School, so there is still a West Philadelphia High School. Um, but there's student housing going into that old building, and just behind it is where these folks all lived. And to be able to respond to, and quickly, which was necessary. I mean, these people got the letter. They have to be out by April 30th. I just can't explain how important it is to have our work informed by the people who are coming into our office. I mean, it's not really our place to tell them, this is what we think you need. I don't think that that's useful for them. It's certainly not useful for me. I don't know what they need. I mean, I don't live their lives, right? Um, and so I think it's really, really important as we're thinking about innovations in legal services 
to remember that some of the best innovations can come from just listening to the community that you're serving. And I think that that is, I mean, the, the, the most important piece. I had the, the, the great privilege of being a visiting professor at Drexel in their community lawyering clinic. And the way that that clinic was designed was we're going to decide what our practice areas are by every year having a community meeting, sitting with members of the community, and saying, what do you guys need? And so they discovered that there were all of these um, what, what we call tangled title cases. So this was like mom died, they never transferred the house into the kids' names, they never opened up the estate, and now it's like great grandkids and nobody knows who the house belongs to. This is happening all over the neighborhood where Drexel University is. And so one of the major practices at the community lawyering clinic is tangled title work. Um, AIDS Law Project, same thing. It's not a geographic community, but it's certainly a community of its own. And the reason there's a housing practice at the AIDS Law Project is because people were coming and saying, well, Medicaid wants to mail me my medicine, but I don't have a stable address. So what do I do about that? And so the housing practice was born at the AIDS Law Project. So I think that that's where community lawyering really plays a part in you know, this innovation, especially for those of us who are working in big cities where the landscape is changing, and exactly like Mike said, you know, this city might become unrecognizable if, if we don't play a part here. Um, I think that's where community lawyering really, really plays a part. Great. Thank you, John. Moving to another city, uh, to St. Louis. Um, Blake is, as I mentioned, the, the head of Arch City Defenders, which I think of as synonymous with innovation, as its very being. And I was hoping that, that you could describe the organization a bit, and specifically about your work there um, as it relates to debtors' prisons and sort of just generally the approach you take. Sure. Uh, so it's always a, I think, blessing and a curse to go last on a panel. <laughs> and I'm feeling the curse part especially today, given this brilliant panel. Um, but I, I want to say at the outset that I think there are two, um, there are two forms of innovation, or what I think of as sort of innovation in, in traditional legal practice, that I think are really critical. And the first is um, developing a practice of listening, and I mean really listening and hearing and believing people who are directly impacted, directly impacted communities, taking them at their word for what they say is happening with them and to them, and not asking them for peer-reviewed studies and you know uh, uh, data-driven analytics that prove that what they're saying is real, but actually believing the experiences of people and acting based on those. Um, and the second innovation, I think, is recognizing the ways in which the law is just profoundly unhelpful, actually, and the legal system is profoundly unhelpful, and so sometimes it just needs to be taken out of the equation. And that's the way in which marginalized and disempowered communities are actually best served. So I'll say a little bit about um, uh, the kind of work that we do at Arch City Defenders, and I think I want to use a, a um, client story as an example. So uh, one of our clients, her name is Kiana Williams, and uh, when she reached driving age, she started accumulating traffic tickets. Kiana came from a poor family. They didn't have much. She didn't have much. Um, her license was in a constant state of flux. Oftentimes it was suspended uh, at the very outset. She didn't even have a license. She couldn't afford insurance. She couldn't afford the registration, the tags. And so she started accumulating these traffic tickets very early on. And Kiana is a single mother um, of uh, an adorable now 12-year-old, but at the time much younger. And she and her daughter uh, experienced periods of homelessness when they were living out of their car, and it was uh, the only means that Kiana and her daughter Royal had to navigate the city. And, and again, I'm from St. Louis, and I imagine a lot of folks here are from, uh, I don't know the geographical distribution, but I imagine there's a lot of coastal folks here, folks in cities that have really great public transit systems. Not the case in St. Louis. 
and driving is really a necessity to navigate life and make it from home to school to work uh, unless you happen to be fortunate enough to have everything in sort of a, a small geographic area. And so uh, the only thing that Kiana and her, her daughter had to get her daughter to school, to after school activities, um, when Kiana did have work to get herself to work, was to use this vehicle. And so she kept using the vehicle and she kept getting tickets. And she would go to court, and when she would go to court, they would tell her, you know, you have these fines associated with these tickets, how are you going to pay? And she'd say, well, I didn't have any money to pay the tickets. And the judge would say, well, you better come up with some money uh, or else you're going to go to jail because these are fines, you have to pay them, that's an order, figure it out, here's your next court date. So you can imagine what eventually happened is she made as many people did in this situation, a perfectly rational decision that she wasn't going to go back just to be thrown in jail because she couldn't afford to pay traffic tickets. And eventually, Kiana found herself in this cycle of uh, tickets, warrants, arrests, and then being held on cash bail that was equivalent to the money that she owed for the tickets initially. And so this is what we uh, refer to as debtor's prisons, that what we found throughout the broader St. Louis metropolitan area, and St. Louis County in particular, which had 90 municipalities, 80 municipal courts uh, in 2015, I think we're only down to about 72 now, is that there were literally thousands of people who were regularly being snatched out of their lives, thrown into jail, demanded money that they didn't have, criminalized purely because of their poverty. And Kiana's story is so powerful because when she, um, when she would be asked sometimes, because she's shared this story many times, she sat on panels, and sometimes people will ask, well, you know, why didn't you stop driving? And she said she would never allow her daughter to be penalized for her mistakes, that her one priority in life was to make sure that her daughter had every opportunity that she never had and that it was unacceptable to her to say, you can never drive, you can never take your daughter to experience these various things. And so she kept driving and, and living her life. And so the ways in which we at Arch City Defenders, so Kiana's one of many, many people who we encountered this story. And the landscape of legal services in St. Louis was not equipped to help someone like Kiana. We had a traditional public defender service that dealt with more serious criminal matters and then we had a uh, traditional legal services organization that only dealt with uh, civil legal needs and a variety of important civil legal needs. But no one was actually working in this municipal court system in St. Louis, which was leading to, again, thousands of people being penalized and arrested every year. And so in Kiana's case, the, the ways in which we've intervened were um, several. So on the direct services front, we entered a, uh, many municipal cases that Kiana had throughout the region, represented her, showed up in court, and this really just meant showing up in court with her. Sometimes we say, you know, what you really need is a warm body and a bar card. <laughs> and if you have that, the difference between what a, someone navigating that system themselves and just having an attorney with them is life altering. And when we say to a judge, well, she actually can't afford to pay this and you need to make some sort of accommodation for that, you're going to have to either abate the fines or uh, convert to community service. We file what are called indigency motions uh, and make sure that she's not actually thrown in jail because she can't pay money. So that's sort of the first step. And over time, we were able to get Kiana's cases resolved, get the uh, warrants dismissed, uh, and she no longer had to worry about on any given day while traversing throughout the city being picked up and thrown in jail. Kiana also became a, a plaintiff in um, a civil rights lawsuit against one of the cities in which she spent a total of about 30 days in jail because of traffic tickets. And that case is, is still pending, um, so I won't go into all the details, but hers is one of many what we call debtor's prison lawsuits that we filed, both individual and class action, throughout the region. Um, under 14th Amendment equal protection and due process to say that these are people who are 
not only being denied process on the front end to actually consider whether they're being given alternatives to making payment that they can't afford, but then they're only being held in jail because they don't have money when someone who had money would not be facing that as a consequence. And then Kiana's also been very involved in our advocacy work and our sort of non-legal media and policy advocacy. She's spoken everywhere from, you know, Washington University in St. Louis to the White House, to, you know, conferences and panels all over the country telling people what's happening to her and people like her uh, so that legal actors within the system understand the ways in which our legal system is criminalizing poverty. And that's sort of the approach that we take. We combine direct services, um, systemic litigation, policy, media advocacy, and collaboration, like Michael said, a lot of collaboration with community partners, organizers, advocates, activists, because we really do understand these problems to be uh, political problems, to be problems that are driven by the poverty of our clients. And then the last thing I want to say briefly is that um, the, the overlap between, I know we're talking about legal services for poor people, but I think it's really critical to understand the overlap between um, class issues and economic issues and racial justice. And it's certainly true in St. Louis, and I think it's true in all of the cities, uh, that all of the panelists work, that when you're talking about legal services for poor people, you're talking about primarily legal services for poor black and brown people. And you could certainly have someone on this panel from an, an Appalachian legal services um, organization that could talk about the need for legal services for poor white people in rural parts all over the country. Um, but I think it's really important to understand the intersection because there are ways in which uh, these challenges are specific to race, these challenges are specific to poor black and brown people in urban communities all over the country. And I know this is a community at this very moment, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that right now in this community, uh, people are grappling with the aftermath of another instance of what appears to have been racialized policing and use of force against a black member of this community. And that's the kind of thing that our clients at Arch City deal with regularly, all the time. And it sort of stands out when it's part of a community that's not used to seeing that kind of violence. But understanding the, the intersection between criminalization of poverty and state violence and racialized policing and other public institutions I think is really important. So we'd like to give you all an opportunity. Uh, hopefully you have the note cards that you can, or the texting or whatever, submitting to Kathy and Jillian so that we can answer. I think this has been such a rich uh, panel, so many questions. Uh, while they are gathering, do you guys need it? Should I ask a question? Can I, can I ask a question? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I guess I, I was interested, your, your warm body and a bar card uh, this set me thinking about, and Judge Fisher's point about this book, Rebooting Justice, which I just have to say, this was given to me by Jackie and my client um, to show that, that having clients who, who read a lot and it was a wonder, so this was a wonderful book. He had no idea that we were doing this panel um, and it's sort of perfect, it's about it's more technology, fewer lawyers, and the future of law, rebooting justice. And this is where I found Judge Fisher, who is highlighted in this book, which is a fantastic, I would suggest anybody after this panel to read this book. But the basic argument of the book um, is that we don't need more lawyers. That's not actually where we should go. Um, and, but when I hear you say, you know, warm body and a bar card. Maybe we just get a lot of warm bodies and a lot of bar <laughs> cards. Maybe we can solve some of these problems. So I'd like any one of you to, to discuss whether more lawyers means more justice, whether that should be um, our push or, or not. Is civil Gideon the way that we should all uh, put, our, put our energy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I never refer to it as civil Gideon. Okay because you know, as we know what Gideon was all about, was making sure that everybody had a lawyer, and I never thought that we would get to that perfect world. Um, I think, though, that it's our responsibility as a profession to work towards being more perfect. And so, yes, I think we do need more lawyers, but at the same time, we have to realize that we are never, in, in this country, because we're actually going back the other way, going to be at a point where everybody can have a lawyer for every civil bread and butter case. And so I, and I hope 
other people get to the realization that we have to look at other things to try to close the gap. And as, as Martha said, it's not perfect, um, but it's, it's, <coughs> it's something. And clearly, as I said, low income, uh, working poor and moderate income people need other measures because they're never gonna have lawyers. I did my own divorce because I couldn't afford a divorce attorney. Uh, and I was a judge. Not that we were paid that well in New York. <laughs> um, so um, I think it's a combination of both. As I said, I don't, these authors um, suggest that we don't need lawyers in low uh, level misdemeanors unless it may lead to deportation or there's special circumstances. I don't buy that. Um, and I think that lawyers play a very valuable role even in lower misdemeanor cases. They also think that we should go towards a, uh, the eBay um, uh, resolution system. If you have a complaint with eBay, you go online and you resolve the dispute online. And I asked the authors, I said, are there any studies because I'm going to bet you that the people who use that are all upper middle class and middle class people. So working poor and poor people aren't going to be able to use that and they're not going to get justice that way. So I do think there is a role for technology. I think it's, it's, it's good for information. It's good for, for, for maybe producing pleadings. Um, but as I said, people don't come with just legal problems. And if we use just technology, we're never going to know that they're, gonna, they're having other problems besides legal problems that lead to um, eviction or judgments and things like that. So I'm, I'm of, the, of, the, of the thought you do everything. Work for more lawyers. Clear Legal Services Corporation needs more money. Um, more state legislatures should be giving more money for civil legal services. But I think we do have to open our minds up to using non-lawyers because non-lawyers can help with the social services problems. They can use they can be used to explain the process. They can be used to hold people's hands because people are scared when they're being evicted or losing their children. Um, and that we can use technology, as I as I already mentioned, and that we can use some other things like limited legal services unbundling uh, for s in certain cases. I, I certainly believe that if you need a full, full representation attorney, you should get it. And that's what this country should be about. But we're nowhere close to that. Um, but that limited services may actually work for some people. Mike, do you have any comments uh, observing what's happening in New York with, as you, one of you mentioned that you know, New York has now uh, New York City is paying $60 million, is that correct? Yeah. Over it's going to be, hundreds? I think in the end, it's going to be a few hundred million? A few yeah. hundred for the city council, yeah. and then there's state money that's a hundred. Wow. To, to provide a lawyer in housing court alone, mm -hmm. right? Not in other... Just housing. Just housing court uh, for any person who's income eligible. Right. So maybe you could talk a little bit about whether... Um, so there, Civil Gideon did uh, sort of prevail as the idea. Um, I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Sure. Well, I'll say the what's going on in New York City is still being phased in. So I think we're all trying to figure out and fighting over what it's going to look like and, and how it's going to be. Um, but I can certainly say as, you know, some of the vision for it was, um, you know, Judge Fisher talked about what housing court is like. And, and Blake, I think, also talked about what poor people's courts are like. You know, they're, place, they're, they're places where before you get lost in the law, before you, you know, uh, don't know what your defenses are, before any of that happens, before you need any assistance, you're first dehumanized. You're, you know, you're disrespected. You're guilty the minute you walk in. You are there to be processed. Um, and, you know, when I, when I hear Blake talking about a, a warm body and a bar card, I mean, what I hear is my own experience, which is if you have a lawyer, you get respected. Um, you know, a lot of the time what, I, what I'm doing in housing court is not saying a ton more than my client would have. I'm just getting listened to, you know. So if I send a client in pro se to file what we call an order to show cause saying I need some more time to pay because here's the situation – it might get signed, but if it goes in with a with a with a with a cover from my office, we know it's getting signed because of the cover, um, not because we're making brilliant legal arguments. Uh, well, we are, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, but you know. So in that sense, 
that, you know, that's the first thing that I thought, you know, from the time when we thought that a right to counsel, which is not the, I you know, which is not exactly what we have, but from the time when we thought that was a dream in New York City to the point where we're phasing it in, the thing that when I imagine it is I imagine just how the courthouse will be different when most of the people there have a lawyer and have to be listened to and you can't get away with treating people like the same kind of crap, that you can't lie to people, you can't uh, push them around. Um, no, I, I would like, after everybody gets a lawyer, everybody should have an organizer so that we can, <laughs> so that, so that we could change the way these courts are, uh, the way the, the, the parts of the bar that use them to collect their, to collect debts or evict people. We change the way that they operate so that uh, you don't have to have a lawyer just to be treated with respect. In the 70s, and that's how old I am, <laughs> one of the best advocates for tenants in the housing court was not a lawyer. She was an organizer from an organization um, and the landlord's attorneys were scared to death of her. <laughs> uh, judges listened to her, um, and she back then was allowed to appear in front of the court, and then the court evolved away from that. And so I still think that when we're talking about spreading justice around, mm -hmm that we cannot count on having lawyers for everybody. You can get respect for people in the courtroom by putting non-lawyers to do some of that because they can be much better at it than lawyers. And a warm body, a, a lawyer that's incompetent um, is not doing anybody uh, uh, any favor. And that's what I'm a little worried about this universal access to uh, counsel is that the legal services and legal aid offices are going to get overwhelmed and not do a good job. I'll just say very quickly, I, I'm all for the, um, I think you said all of the above or do it all approach, whatever it was. I'm all for that approach, um, particularly in the context of, you know, not understanding that we're doing triage for people that are in crisis. And I think you should do everything you can for people in that moment. Um, but I would love for us to adopt as a guiding principle that if it's good for poor people, it's good for rich people. So we're going to start having you know, apps to help people navigate through courts. Let's have everyone have apps to navigate through court. <laughs> if we're going to rely on technology, technology, let's just take all the lawyers out of the court. What makes me very nervous is a two-tiered system in which we have people that can afford lawyers having that form of representation and people who can't having a different form of representation. We could get to a point where moderate income people have less lawyers and less justice than poor people. So we have to think about that also, because in the end, it's the moderate income people who are mouthy and who vote who might decide, well, we won't fund these programs anymore. So let's figure out how to fix the justice system. Let's, as I said to the authors, let's not call it reboot. Let's call it kick the justice system in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the title of the panel. <laughs> Well, I think that um, there are things that uh, imaginative, devoted individuals, whether they're lawyers or not, can do on behalf of people who are being mistreated. And I, uh, I'm so glad to see Stacy Grossman here. Um, uh, the current uh, fellow who has the David Grossman Fellowship, um, uh, just as a demonstration of this, working with a team of uh, bankruptcy lawyers and a team of uh, housing lawyers found a way to uh, avoid the sale of a, a housing uh, building uh, that had 50 tenants in it and who were all going to lose their housing and uh, found a way to finance it and have it purchased by a trust that will keep it for 50 years. I, I mean, just this extraordinary work that a recent law grad did by putting together and leveraging bankruptcy lawyers and housing lawyers. So I think that we should not uh, underestimate uh, the extraordinary changes that one individual can make. At the same time, I think that the dehumanizing and really, let's just call it what it is, oppressive treatment that many poor people uh, experience every day in courts, in social service agencies, with the Veterans Affairs, uh, it, that's part of what is the condition of poverty and racism in America. And 
uh, we already have the divestment of middle class and working class people from a lot of these systems. I mean, the eBay's dispute resolution system resolved more disputes last year than many courts do with no human being involved, just the algorithms. And uh, you know, people with money pay for arbitrators. They go outside the courts. And what really worries me is the, uh, the divestment of the public sphere, period. Um, and so I think we have to talk about systems change as well, and that's not just providing lawyers. If very quickly, I could just say. I just want, anybody who has a card, do you, can you wave it around just so that Jill, so go ahead, Jill. Yeah, so very quickly, I just wanted to say when we're talking about like online dispute resolutions and that model of technology, um, this week I lost my dog. We have her back. So we are thrilled to have her back. Um, but we had used an online pet service, and their dispute resolution, it was all online, but we lost our dog, and they were in Seattle, and they couldn't help us. So I worry a little bit about when we talk about these technological sure. solutions, that when there's a real crisis, what you need is a person on the ground stapling up flyers, which is how we found the dog, <laughs> to actually solve that problem for you. And so... I think that there is, we need to do both. I right. think both is important, but I also want to keep in mind that when we talk about totally moving in that direction, it's just not practical. Dimeno, when you talk about, you talked earlier, and, and again, with law reform, what, if, if you had a magic wand, were, are there specific things that you would look to, to to change in terms of law reform? I think Blake talked about it was just way too complicated. Things are way too complicated. Um, or maybe that was Mike. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> But what, what kinds of things would you, would you change that you think would promote, um, that would solve some of these problems? Well, you have to pick particular areas. Yeah. I mean, the catch-22s that, that says that a, you know, a, a mother can't get her kids back till she has housing and can't get her housing till she has her kids back. I mean, right. <laughs> uh, right. Or, you know, the, the fines and fees that Blake is talking about, um, the, the laws just, just should be changed. Um, and the way in which, um, you know, if anyone's had to pay their taxes recently, anyone have that experience? <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have, you don't understand the tax code. And uh, the, 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 we, we have consumer protection laws that often are pretty good, but who can understand them? So uh, that's what I mean about law reform. That's great. So we have some great questions here. Um, this person asked, it's so great that so many legal services attorneys on this panel are doing great work responsive to the community, but how do you continue to do that when a lot of the grants do not give you the freedom to do that type of work? Um, as funders request more data, incentivize advice cases, give less money for the same amount of work, how do you deal with all that? So how do you deal with funding? Maybe Yeah, so this is a real struggle for us right now. Um, we are in Philadelphia trying to follow in the footsteps of New York and D.C. and have piloted what we hope will become more lawyers for low-income people. What this has meant, though, is that the city has given us this money, but they don't actually want us to hire any more lawyers. They just want me to take more cases. Mm. <laughs> and I don't actually have time to do that. <laughs> I was already taking as many cases as I could take. Right. So the issue was never that, like, oh, if only the organization had more money, I would help more people. <laughs> like, uh, listen, I am helping as many people as I, humanly possible without, you know, going home and dying on my couch from exhaustion. Um, and so I think that there is this real struggle now. I mean, meanwhile, we have other funding that's being cut, and we're suddenly competing with, my organization is not Legal Services Corp funded, but our sister organization is. When there was concern earlier this year there wasn't going to be Legal Services Corp funding, then it was now we're competing with organizations for funding that we had thought we could count on, because now they're not going to have any money. And so everybody's just, everyone's really stressed out. There's higher deliverables on every grant. Everybody wants technology to capture this data for us. And, you know, we, we're lawyers. We're, you know, not IT specialists for the most part. There are some. We have a paralegal in my unit who is really, really good at technology. I am not. I can do an Excel spreadsheet. That's the fanciest thing I can do on the computer. Um, I'm really good at streaming Netflix. If anyone needs help with that. Um, but 
I think that there is this real struggle now, and what that has meant for us is we've had to really, really, or this is a panel about innovation, we've had to really innovate. How can we make our intake more efficient without mm -hmm. dehumanizing the people who are coming in for that intake? Right. Um, how do we make our court appearances more efficient? Again, without dehumanizing our clients, because I, I do want for any client who sees me to feel like they got the same service that they would, got if, they would get if they were paying me. I can't tell you how many times I'll have a client say to me, would this have been different if I had a real paid lawyer? And, and that's the point where I want to point at my degree and go, no. <laughs> um, but... But I don't. I won't do that. Um. Speaking, speaking of your degree, and as a as an H Lab uh, alum, I, I'd love any of you to speak. And I, I guess I, this is my question, but luckily someone asked it. It's not just my question. And that is, is how what role do clinics play? What roles do law schools play in in answering some of the questions we've talked about today? Um, and how often do any of you work with clinics in your work? And how how experience? Uh, how did you feel when you came out of Harvard with your clinical experiences? I can speak very briefly on this to let other panelists speak, because you've heard my voice enough. But um, I was both an HLab member. I also taught this clinic as a visiting professor. I also spent a lot of time this week, in fact, talking to um, some very smart folks about the roles that I think clinical education should have. Um, and how do you balance you know, educating students versus serving poor people, and, and what does that look like? I will first say that without the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, like I wouldn't be half the legal services lawyer I am today. So big thank you to Werner, who's sitting over there, who was my CI. <laughs> um, but I, I also think that there is this real balance with, as a legal services lawyer, I would love clinics who have more money than we have to take cases that we don't have the resources to take. The clinics aren't always interested in those cases. They're often more interested in what's the, the sexier case to take. Um, and, and so I think that that's some frustration. And I think the very smart people I was talking to this week probably didn't love my answer that, honestly, a more boring case might have just as much learning value for a student as the case that they think is going to be really, really interesting and they're going to get to go to the state Supreme Court and do X, Y, and Z. It's really true. I think the clinics could be doing more. Well, I, I can answer from New York. That the cl clinical professors are very resistant to doing what I would say basic bread and butter cases. Um, and they're very resistant to doing uh, limited scope. And since students are only available per semester, it's hard to do full representation because, you know, the cases don't end that way. But you could do more representation using limited scope, but it's the clinical professors in New York have been totally resistant to that. Now, the court has used students in the summer because the court is a uh, student practice, has a student practice, and we found that the law students were quite effective uh, during the summer doing limited representation, mostly settling cases, which most cases in New York have settled anyway. Um, and so we need to, to re-educate our faculty, we need to re-educate our law schools, because when I asked how many of you knew about limited scope, it means we're not doing a very good job at that. Uh, we need to figure out how lawyers need to talk to regular people so that we have laws that are understandable, which Martha said simplification of the court system, it starts in the law schools. Because we teach you all to be very complicated. You know, the four wits <laughs> and the moreovers, and you know what, that's not what people understand. And that's not what they need. And so it's, I think it starts here, actually. Yeah, um, I, I just think any experience with talking to real people Real people defined as not lawyers or people <laughs> trying to be lawyers is always a great thing, and you don't get nearly enough of that in law school. And clinics are really one of the rare opportunities you have to do a lot of that. And so I certainly encourage every law student I talk to to, to get clinical experience and get out into the world and meet people where they are. Um, and our experience at, at Arch City Defenders has been that we, uh, I mean, we both have for an organization of our size, we have a steady and large group of um, interns and externs coming through our office. There are three uh, former interns in the room right now um, from Arch City. And so we, 
really value what they bring to our organization. Uh, we've partnered with local clinics on some of our systemic litigation, and that's made it possible for us to bring some of the litigation because ultimately everything becomes a capacity issue. You know, everyone is doing as much as they possibly can, and it's an all hands on deck situation. And so I think there is a lot more clinics can be doing. I would encourage. Um, law students who are looking for those kind of opportunities to like reach out to local legal aid and um, legal services organizations and, and see uh, how you can get involved. And then if you can craft you know, something that also works with the law school and get some credit, even better. You're building the building that the rest of these students are going to build. So that is a great way to, to end. I want you all to join me in thanking these amazing panelists. to thank Jillian and Kathy, who here, here. are the more wonderful people. <laughs> Kathy, <laughs> this is, come on, come on, ladies. So this panel is truly the, their brainchild. They did all the work, it's and awesome. for some reason, I got to stand up here. They should really have been here. Uh, but these are two, uh, uh, two amazing women who are going to go do great things. Jillian is going to legal, do legal services next year on an EJW in Philadelphia. And Kathy is going to go to a firm and do lots of pro bono work next year. <laughs> <laughs> and then go to a clerkship and then become a legal services lawyer. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you.